Welcome to this WiseL DAX for Power BI tutorial. In this part of the series, we'll take a quick look at field parameters. So the idea behind the video is to provide your end user with a choice over how they display a visual in a report. We'll start with a slightly old fashioned technique for allowing a user to choose which measure gets displayed in a visual. Once we've done that, we'll move on to the slightly more modern and streamlined field parameter feature to achieve the same result. We'll explain how you can edit the field parameters to control what labels get displayed and which measures are, are available for selection. And then towards the end of the video, we'll look at how you can use field parameters to control the grouping in visuals as well. So let's get started. To get started, I've already created a basic data model based on our standard list of movies. I've also added a few basic measures, one for the average runtime minutes, another for the max, and another for the sum. As usual, if you want to follow along with the video using the same data as I'm using, I'll drop a link in the description below that you can use to download a file and then follow along with me. For the first visualization in this report, I'm going to insert a matrix. And I'm going to add into that matrix the genre field from the genre table to populate the rows bucket. Then from the certificate table, I'll add the certificate field to populate the columns bucket. And then finally, from the film table, I'm going to insert the runtime minutes. That'll populate the values bucket and automatically have the sum function assigned to it. Now, as a report author, you'll be fairly familiar, I suspect, with the ability to change this aggregation in the values bucket. If I click on the drop down arrow next to it, I can choose any of the other standard functions like average, etc. That's great as a report author, but what if you want your end users to have that same ability? So the first part of this video is going to show you a slightly old fashioned technique for making that work. The first step is to create a list that the user can select from in a slicer to choose which aggregation to apply. There are several ways to do this. For this video, we're going to use the enter data option from the home tab of the ribbon. That will launch a dialog box letting us create our own custom table. So I'm going to change the column name there. I'm going to call it chosen function. And then in the list, I'm going to just write in some of the, the names of functions or things similar to it. You don't have to type in the exact function names. So for example, if I wanted the sum, I could enter that as a total. Then I'll enter the word average. And then let's go for maximum. So they don't have to be the exact same names as the functions we're going to use. What we're then going to do is rename the table. Let's call this one um, uh, function picker. And when we load that data, it'll form a table in our data model that isn't connected to anything else. What we can then do is create a measure which reads the value of the selected value from the chosen function column and then returns the value from the appropriate measure. So we can add this measure wherever we like. I think it probably makes sense to drop it in the all measures table. So let's right click all measures and choose new measure. And then this is nothing more complicated than creating a simple switch function to return the correct result. So let's call the function, uh, sorry, let's call the measure result. And we'll say equals switch. And the value we're going to test for is the selected value of the um, function, or sorry, chosen function column. There we go. So then it's the laborious task of writing in the various values that we might have selected. So total first, and if I select total, I want to return the sum of runtime. And then on the next line, if I've chosen average, then I want to return the average runtime. Sorry about this tool tip that keeps on getting in the way. And then finally, if I select the maximum, we can return the max runtime. Okay, so at that point, there's our basic function created. I'll uh, enter that to create my measure, and then I can add a slicer to the page. I'll add a slicer visual. I'm going to populate that slicer with the chosen function column from my function picker table. And then in my matrix, I'm going to take away this um, reference to the runtime minutes field and replace that with my result measure. So of course, it won't return a result until I've picked something. If I select average, I'll get the average runtime because it's just returning that value of that measure. Maximum gives me the max and total gives me the sum. A quick little bit of tidying up. This doesn't work, of course, if I have either no values selected in the slicer, or if I select more than one by holding down the control key and clicking on more. 
so it probably makes sense to set the slicer to a single selection. With the slicer selected, I can head over to the Format pane, head to Slicer Settings, change the Selection options to only allow a single selection. And then I'll always see a sensible result in that matrix, because I always have to have one and only one option selected in the slicer. So that's a fairly old-fashioned way to give the user a bit more control over what the visuals in a report display. But it's a little bit of a fiddly process and completely redundant these days with the advent of field parameters. So to demonstrate a more streamlined way of achieving essentially the same result we've achieved here, let's add a new page to the report, and I'm going to add a basic matrix, which I'm going to populate once again with the genre and the certificate fields. So that'll populate the rows and the columns buckets. I'm going to leave the values bucket empty for the moment because we're going to generate a field parameter that will do that job for us. To create a field parameter, let's head to the modeling tab in the ribbon, choose the new parameter option, and from the drop-down list, select fields. We're going to set the name of the parameter. We're going to call it value field. And then all we have to do is choose which options we'd like the user to be able to select from. All I'm going to do is go to my all measures table and drop in each of the three original measures I created. So I'll avoid the result one that I created there. So the average, max, and sum of runtime. I want to make sure that I get a slicer added to the same page as well. So I'm going to hit the Create button. And we'll see, we get a slicer giving me a list of, uh, a list of options for the same three measures I've just inserted. All we have to do to make this appear in the matrix then, if we head over to the matrix, is find our new value field table sitting at the bottom of the data panel there. And there's a single field in there called value field. I'm going to drag that into the values bucket. And you'll see if I don't have any value selected from my slicer, it shows all three measure results. If I pick a single one, it filters that list or that matrix to show only the one that I've selected. So it's a bit better than our original old-fashioned technique in that we can display more than one thing at the same time, or only a single one if that's what we prefer. Now let's say you wanted to modify the label for each item displayed in your slicer. Of course at the moment they're using the original names of the measures that we added to the field parameter. Changing your measure names at this point won't influence the labels displayed in the slicer, if you want to alter that, you need to head back to the value field parameter table that's been created. So if you select the value field table, you'll see how Power BI has decided to generate this table. So there are three columns in it altogether. The first one represents the label that appears in the slicer. The second one actually controls what value gets returned using the name of function. And then the third column controls the sort order of the items in the list. So if you want to modify the labels without affecting anything else, you can happily do that by just editing the text in the first column. So average runtime, um, maybe we'll call that one biggest runtime. And then rather than sum, we can say total runtime. If you decided you wanted to change the order of the results, you could modify the number there at the right hand side. Um, I'm going to leave those in the same order for the moment. So if I just update that table definition, we'll see when we clear that table, we've now got some more sensible descriptive labels for your end user, but the functionality is still the same. Now I mentioned that changing the name of any of the original measures doesn't influence the value displayed in the slicer, but changing a measure name does affect one part of your field parameter table. Just to demonstrate that, I'm going to switch into the table view and have a look at the value field parameter table. So the second column there is populated using the name of function, which references directly the original measures that we added into the parameter dialog box. The reason it's done that way is so that you can safely change the measure name. Let's say we wanted to modify, maybe I'm going to change the max runtime original measure name to call it biggest runtime minutes, for example. So a completely different name than it originally had. Now, if our parameter table was only relying on the, the, the names, the, the strings that represent the names of those objects, that wouldn't automatically be inherited by the parameter table. But if I head back to the value field table, you'll see that changing any original measure name when you directly reference it anywhere else in the model, that name change is inherited. 
So that means that it generates the correct fully qualified name for that measure so that when I switch back to the report view and choose biggest runtime, it now uses biggest runtime minutes. You can add new options to your field parameters fairly easily without having to go through the original process again. Let's add a new basic measure to the All Measures table that's going to find out how many films there are. It's just going to count the rows of the film table. So I'm going to call this one count films equals count rows and then refer to the film table. Once I've updated that, I'd like to add that measure as an option in my field parameter. So to do that, I can head back to the value field and then I'm going to quickly copy the last entry there, the last line, line number four, add a comma to the end of that, and then paste it in on the next line. I'll edit the label so that that refers to, let's say that uh, that's going to be called count of films. And then I want that to return the result of referencing the count films measure. I'll just alter the sort order as well. So that comes in as the last entry. So I'll give that the sort order of three. And then if I update that value field parameter definition, I'll see I get a new entry in my slicer automatically. And if I select counter films, it returns the value of that measure. One of the really great things about field parameters is that you can use them to control any field for a visualization. So at the moment, we're just controlling what value gets displayed for this matrix. We could also use a field parameter to control which field is used to perform the grouping. So we're not always stuck with just looking at the genre by the certificate. To do that, let's make a little bit of space on the page. I'm going to narrow my value field um, slicer and then drag my matrix across to the right hand side and then give a bit of space at the top as well. Let's create a new field parameter to select the field used to create the row groups in this matrix. I'm going to head back to the modeling tab in the ribbon, choose new parameter, choose fields, and I'm going to call this new parameter row field. Then from the list on the right hand side, I can simply pick which columns I want to use to populate these group options. I'm going to add the full name field from the director table. I'm going to go to the genre table and insert that as well. And then I'm also going to go to the studio table and add the studio field. I'm going to make sure that I have a slicer added to the page. And then when I click create, see, there's my row field selector. Now, at the moment, of course, this won't have any effect on the matrix. If I can at some point get that to change its size, there we go, finally. Um, if I did pick um, studio, full name, genre, it doesn't influence the matrix just yet. To make that work, I have to select the matrix and then remove whichever field is currently displayed in the rows bucket and replace that with my new row field um, parameter table. I'm going to drag the row field column into that rows bucket and then you'll see when I select different items in that slicer, it alters the way the matrix is grouped. Another quite cool thing about this is that if I select more than one thing at the same time, I'll see that the matrix is grouped by that combination of fields. So I had studio selected first, and then I held down the control key and selected genre as well. If I look now, I can expand each studio into the various, uh, various genres of films made by that studio. Again, I can then include the full name field and that will then provide yet another level. So 20th Century Vox, action, and then the list of directors. If I clear all the selection from my slicer, the combination of fields is used in the order they're listed. So it goes by director, then by genre, and then by studio. Again, if you wanted to modify anything about that, you've got the same options we saw with the value field slicer. So if I head to my row field, parameter table, I could maybe change, first of all, let's change the label. Full name isn't particularly descriptive. Let's change that so it's called director. Then I think maybe we should change the sort order that they're displayed in the list. I want the genre field to appear first, then studio, and then the director. So having done that, if I update my parameter table, we'll see if I clear all the selections from my slicer, it goes by genre, and then by studio, and then by director this time. And then if I wanted to pick any individual one, 
it will sort or group just by that field. We could use exactly the same technique to set up a column field parameter. Let's quickly finish off by, by doing that. If I head back to the modeling tab in the ribbon, choose new parameter and then choose fields. Let's call this new parameter column group, or sorry, column field, I should say. And then from the fields list, I'm going to pick the certificate field from the certificate table. And then let's see, let's go with region as well. I think we'll just stick with those two. For a matrix columns, I think we want to pick fields that have a limited number of entries. So we'll add the slicer to the page, hit create, slicer, and drag that over just towards the top of the matrix. And then I want to make sure that the field that populates the columns area of that matrix uses my new column field column. So I'll drag that in from my parameter table. And now I can choose certificate or region, switching between the two at will. So there you go, there's the, the basics of field parameters. It didn't really in involve writing that much DAX for a, for a DAX tutorial, but it is still an important concept, I think, and a useful one. And it's tied in, I think, with the, the, uh, the, the other videos in this section of the tutorial. So hope you found that one useful. Thanks very much for watching. See you next time.